The Democrat Party released its latest results after the Nevada primary announcing Bernie Sanders has won in Iowa. Pause to let you get that joke. As Sanders continues on track to win the party's nomination for president, a party spokesman released a statement while running around in a circle, tearing his hair, and making a high-pitched babbling noise by squealing at the same time he riffled his lips with his fingers. In fact, that was the statement. Exit polls in Nevada show Sanders far ahead of some sad old man who keeps telling anyone who'll listen that he used to be vice president to Barack Obama and then grabbing them by the arm and saying, you like Obama, don't you? Everybody loves Barack. The gay guy came in third, then the make-believe Indian, and finally the short, angry lady who pretends to be insulted all the time. The exit pollsters asked voters two questions. One, who did you vote for? And two, what the hell were you thinking? One young man who voted for Bernie told the pollsters, quote, I voted for Bernie because I saw a TikTok video of people eating cats in Venezuela and thought it would be really funny if that happened here. Also, I'm not very bright. I mean, look at me, unquote. A suburban homemaker said, quote, I voted for Bernie because Donald Trump says rude things, and before I tolerate that, I'd rather lose all my freedom and have my children starve, unquote. A third voter told the pollsters he voted for Bernie because he was secretly a Republican and was just messing around. In a victory speech to a cheering crowd of ignorant knuckleheads, Bernie said, quote, We are taking on the Democrat establishment because they're still clinging to some vestiges of sanity, and I hate that. I have a new vision of America that I got from watching the Purge movies while reading an instruction manual called 1984, unquote. He then pumped the air with his fist, clutched his chest, and fell over, shouting, don't release my medical reports. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah So yeah, Bernie Sanders won the Nevada caucuses. He won them handily. He won them by a long chalk. And because the press is a pack animal, they're all now declaring him the winner of all the primaries forever, which he may well ultimately be, certainly the front runner. But it's not over yet. And there's still Super Tuesday in the convention and so on. No one knows what's going to happen yet. But the problem for the Democrats is they have no one who can beat Bernie because they have no one who actually disagrees with Bernie. They only have people who are afraid to say what Bernie says out loud. That doesn't make them alternative choices. It just makes them sniveling cowards. Sure, one candidate may pay lip service to free markets and another may dither about whether he wants to take your private health insurance insurance away today or tomorrow. But every single one of them thinks the solution to the problem is government. And that's even before they find out what the problem happens to be. There's an old joke about Republicans. They used to say that if Democrats said they wanted to destroy the country in three years, Republicans would negotiate for six years and call it a victory. That's now the two sides of the Democrat Party in a nutshell. They either want sudden socialism to kill the country right away like a heart attack or slow socialism to eat away at our freedoms like cancer. In her weekend column, Wall Street Journal journalist Kimberly Strassel noted that even Mike Bloomberg has been sucked into the Democrat socialist machine. Since he formally joined the race, he's rushed to join the pack, she writes. He unveiled an eye-popping plan to raise taxes by $5 trillion, socking it to corporations and rich people. He says he doesn't see the current $1 trillion annual deficit as a problem. He reversed himself on financial regulation, promising to impose a 0.1% financial transaction tax of the same type proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and to crack down on Wall Street, unquote. Well, of course he did all those things. He had to. He's running as a Democrat. The issue is not that Bernie is leading the Democrats. It's that Bernie is the Democrats. He's the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party does not want to admit it is. The problem for all of them, the reason they got there is because you're responsible for the logical conclusion of your ideas because your ideas will ultimately work themselves out to their logical conclusion. That's inevitable. So when you start out, you better own them. Bernie is what the Democrats represent, so Bernie deserves to win. And as dangerous as his nomination would be for the rest of us, at least we'll know the danger we're in so we can face it head on and beat it if God is still willing to bless America. We're going to talk about more about Bernie and what he stands for and what the Democrat Party stands for, what the press represents, and we'll also have some examples 
of leftism gone amok throughout the country. Let us first talk about ebb sleep. As you know, some of us never sleep. No names mentioned but me. I never sleep. And listen, I'm, I'm at peace with that. But if you're not and if you've tried everything else, I don't think taking drugs is a good idea. I really don't. Try ebb sleep. Try ebb sleep. It is a machine that basically chills your forehead. I tried it out, and I have to say, it really did give me a sense of being far away from myself. It's kind of slowed down my thoughts, and it gave me a little bit of uh, a little kind of more peaceful vibe than I usually have. <laughs> and for all I know, if you're one of these people who likes to sleep sometimes, you may like the ebb machine. Ebb's cooling, calming nature is designed to counteract the way the mind and body react to stressful situations. It allows you to reach restraint restorative sleep quicker so you can be at peak performance the next day. Traditional sleep aids shut down your mind and body completely. Ebb works with your brain's natural rhythms to help you sleep the way your body was meant to. Have the energy to do things you love again by getting the sleep you need. Ebb's natural solution has no morning side effects and allows you to get back to your peak performance. Our listeners can now try Ebb risk-free for 60 nights to confirm it's the solution you've been looking for at tryebb.com. Dot com slash Clavin. That's T R Y E B B dot com slash Clavin. Tryeb dot com slash Clavin. Order today to get the sleep you need and deserve. And if you do, tell me what it's like. And also tell me how do you spell Clavin? You must be able to answer that question. There are no easy. There are no There are no easy in Clavin. There are no ease in Clavin. So Bernie is now full of confidence. You can't blame him. He's won these three primaries. He's going into the the buzzsaw now, but he's got you know this was this was really a good win for him. It was not only a big win for him; he got the youth vote and he got the Latino vote. So that should make Joe Biden. If Joe Biden is still around, if Joe Biden still thinks he has any chance, and why he would, I don't know. Uh, but it, that should make Joe Biden nervous because his whole thing is the minorities like me. I'm neat. I was with Barack, and so they'll come after me. But this was showed that Bernie can put together a coalition too. Here. Here he is, is, cut number 11. Here is Bernie celebrating his victory. We are going to win across the country because the American people are sick and tired of a president who lies all of the time. They are sick and tired of a corrupt administration. They want an administration which is based on the principles of justice, economic justice, social justice, racial justice, and environmental justice. I call him a socialist slash communist, okay? Because that's what he is. <laughs> that's what he is. But that's a confident guy. How do you know he's confident? One, he's in Texas. He, he, went to, he left the state because he knew it. he had it wrapped up. He's in Texas where the big delegate count is. And so he's already campaigning there. And two, he's not going after uh, the other Democrat candidates. He's going after Trump. So he's already looking forward to a win. And on paper, yes, Trump should win. Trump should smush him like a bug, given Trump's record, given the incredible economy we have, given the peace we have, given the way that Trump has rearranged our foreign policy in a, a sane way after Obama turned it into this insane leftist nonsense that uh, favored uh, countries like Iran. On paper, Trump should smush him. But you know, there was an interview with uh, Clint Eastwood, the great Clint Eastwood in the Wall Street Journal. And at the end of this, Eastwood sort of said offhandedly, I think we should go for Mike Bloomberg because, and here's what he said. He said, I, I approve of certain things that Trump has done, but he says he wishes the president would act, quote, in a more genteel way without tweeting and calling people's name, people names. So this proves an important point, which is that in the end, everyone agrees with me. So you can save a lot of time by listening to the show instead of forming your own, your own opinions, because this is what I've been telling you for a long time. It is not, it's not, you know, look, look. Trump talks New York ease. I talk New York ease sometimes too. I get it. We're not supposed to take it too seriously. A lot of people love it. A lot of people are inspired by it. But some people are put off by it. And I, said, I think especially women are put off by it. And I think that's something we have to take into account. The, the classic bind that the Democrats are in, right, is if they don't give the nomination to Bernie, his people will not follow the guy who gets the nomination. If they do give the nomination to Bernie, they are taking a big risk of putting a very, very radical candidate out there who may not be in keeping with what the rest of the country believes. The problem that we have on the right 
is that Trump has won because of his brashness, because of his pugilistic nature, because he's willing to take on the press, because he's willing to call to call people names, because he has to, because the press is busy calling him names and, and calling us names. And so he has to be use the bully pulpit, pulpit to fight back. But the other side of that is that alienates certain voters that he is going to need, like suburban women. Personally, I think he's going to be all right. I think he's going to win this fight. But both candidates have their weaknesses, and you do not ever know what's going to happen. So let's take a look at things from the Democrat side. First of all, Bernie, I mean, (laughs) the idea that Bernie is a Democrat socialist as opposed to a communist is just a complete nonsense. Here's a cut that came out over the weekend, an old cut. And these are going to continue to come out because we know who Bernie is. An old uh, cut of Bernie on 60 Minutes talking about the revolution in Cuba. This is cut 19. We're very opposed to the authoritarian nature of Cuba. But, you know, you got, it's unfair to simply say everything is bad. You know, when Fidel Castro came into office, you know what he did? He had a massive literacy program. Is that a bad thing? Even though Fidel Castro did it? There's a lot of dissidents imprisoned in, in Cuba. That's right. And we condemn that. Crazy Bernie. He is one crazy dude. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's like the old joke about Mussolini making the trains run on time. Yeah, he imprisoned a lot of people, but they could read. He imprisoned them and he shot them, but they could read when they died. It was good. When they gave them the execution paper, they said, hey, I can, and then they were gone. But they could read when they were gone. I mean, that's the kind of thing he's saying. And, you know, he's always saying that what he wants is Denmark. But somebody, I think it was Carol Markowitz of the New York Post, tweeted and said, He's never been to Denmark. He's been to the the Soviet Union, never been to Denmark. Talked up Castro, has never gone to Denmark and said, here's the policy I want. He said, I met a guy in Denmark once. So, you know, it's not real. It is not real what he's talking about. This guy is, in fact, a tyrant. Here's another cut of him talking about the cost of his programs. This is cut 18. Do you have a price tag for for all this? We do. I mean, you know, and and, uh, the, the price tag is... It will be substantially less than letting the current system go. I think it's about thirty trillion. That's just for Medicare for all. Just, just Medicare about. for all. Do you have a, a price tag for all of these things? No, I don't. We try to no. <laughs> so, so the guy is a total, total It's thirty trillion. And remember, remember, whenever they say it's going to be cheaper than what we're spending now. What they mean is everybody together spending this money is going to be cheaper than that. But the money does not belong to him. The money belongs to the people who make it. This is the thing that's the problem there. You know, they, they have the, the Ayn Rand wrote a book where they had to where a, a, a dysfunctional dystopia had to dis- rediscover the word I because everybody was d- referred to as we. Right. And that is the, Bernie's slogan, not I. Us, right? And that's that's his slogan. It is a classic, classic socialism. The problem with that is you why do you work? Why do people work? They work to earn. They work to make their lives better. They're inspired to make their lives better. The people who are more inspired do more. The people who are more ambitious do more and get more rewards. If they don't get more rewards, there's no point in being ambitious. And so those ambitions go by the boards. That's what happens in every single socialist country. Ever. That's why the prime minister of Denmark is out there going, no, 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 we're not socialists. Don't call us that. But the real problem, the real problem for the Democrats is not what Bernie Sanders says. It's what Pete Buttigieg said after the Nevada primaries. This is uh, the caucuses. This is cut 17. This is important. We share these ideals, but I believe the best way to defeat Donald Trump and deliver for the American people is to broaden and galvanize the majority that supports us on the critical issues. Senator Sanders believes in an inflexible ideological revolution that leaves out most Democrats. I believe we need to defeat Donald Trump and turn the page on this era in our politics by establishing a tone of belonging bringing an end to the vicious, viciousness and the bullying that is tearing apart our country. We must change what it feels like to live in the United States of America. And that is a real difference from Senator Sanders' revolution with the tenor of combat and division and polarization leading to a future where whoever wins the day, nothing changes the toxic tone of our politics. Now, let's just unpack that for just a minute. He starts by saying we share his ideals. We share his ideals. The problem is the tone, right? (laughs) 
First of all, have you ever noticed that nothing Pete Buttigieg says means anything? I mean, <laughs> the words just keep coming out of his mouth, and you're going like, I, I hear, see the words, I see your mouth moving, and I hear the words, but I do not know what you were saying. But what he is saying is, it's the tone. It's the tone. You know, we need a tone that's inclusive as we take all your rights away. We need a tone that's nice as we replace the, the magic of capitalism, which has lifted all of us into greater wealth so that even the poor among us are living at the level of the middle class in the 1980s. That's an amazing fact, okay? It's an amazing fact that the, you know, poor people have iPhones, poor people have television sets, poor people are suffering from obesity, which is the first time in history that's happened. All that is capitalism. All that is capitalism. And yes, you know, capitalism can come along with some programs and some safety nets and all that stuff. There's not, nothing is absolute in this world and no, uh, no philosophy, no system is going to override the corruption and foolishness of the human heart. There's always got to be some breaks and there's always got to be some bookends and all this stuff. But what Pete Buttigieg said is the problem with the Democrat Party is all they're talking about is tone and people do rise above that. And this is my problem. This is my problem with the suburban women who criticize Donald Trump. I, and, and what Clint Eastwood said, too, I mean, I disagreed with Eastwood on this, is that, you know, he's a, he's a libertarian. I'm more of a conservative. But the tone, tone does matter. I think it matters the way you talk to people. I think it matters to women even more than it matters to men. Men are a little bit more uh, roughshod and they go, they do like blunt talk and they think of it as a sign of strength and all this stuff. But it does matter how you talk to people. It does, it does make a difference. You know, facts may not care about your feelings, but people care about their feelings and people, that's, you know, your inner life and your inner life is what life is all about. Tone does matter. But it doesn't matter more than policy. And in the end, if your tone is a pleasant tone selling bad policy, that is worse. That is worse than if you have a bad tone, but you're doing good policy, which is what Trump's got going on. What Trump has got going on is that his policies work. His policies have changed everything for the better. And I wish he could control his tone, too. I wish he knew when to shut up, too. I don't agree with the guys who are constantly leaving notes in my comments section or sending tweets out, you know, yeah, that's because you're, you don't understand the greatness of Donald You know, I, I, get, I do get Donald Trump. I see what he's done. That's, I'm amazed. I think he's done a terrific job. I've told you where I was wrong in the past. All of that stuff. He still has to know when to shut up, and he doesn't. He has absolutely no control, and that's going to hurt us, especially going forward. But what Pete Buttigieg is saying is the exact opposite, is we need good tone to mask our crappy policies, and that's why Bernie is in the lead. Let us talk about honey. Money matters. You want to save it. The way to save it is with honey, because honey goes on and searches for deals. Remember the old days? Does anybody remember going through coupons in the Sunday paper? You had to go through coupons and cut them out and say, oh, I, I'm going to buy that. I could use a coupon there. Don't do that. Don't do that anymore. That's not the way to do it. Honey is a free online shopping tool that automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them to your cart. And you know how great it feels to save, but how does it feel to save with money? Sa with honey, saving with honey feels like sliding into a seat on the train just before the doors close. You put this thing on, it, ta it takes about, I don't know, 90 seconds to put it on your computer. It sits in the background. Then you go on your sites where you shop and it looks around and says, oh, here's a deal. This will give you a lower price. I use it on uh, Amazon all the time. It tells me when I can get something for less. Using Honey feels great. Think of it as a little daily victory. Plus, it's free to use and installs in just a few seconds. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Andrew. That's joinhoney.com slash Andrew. You want to hear the tone, you know, the, the, the tone of Bernie Sanders. Here's the thing. The tone of Bernie Sanders is leftism. The tone of Bernie Sanders is leftism. The roughness, the way people talk, the threats that unions got in Nevada from the Bernie bros. They keep saying, well, these are just a couple of online followers. That was what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said. This is the life online. That's the problem they have. No, because we have already seen all the people who work for Bernie saying the gulags were not a bad thing. We're going to drive dra drag people out of MSNBC because they don't like the liberals and set them on fire. We're ready for violence. We're ready to disturb things. That is what socialism does to people. And, it, and there's a reason for it. And we'll take a look more just in, in just a second. We've got to look at some of the press because the press is part of this, too. I mean, this is the thing. The press is part of this, too. 
because the press has been selling leftism as if it were a game. You know, it's like a, it is a game to them, right? They're making big bucks. They're going into their offices. They're sitting in their air conditioned studios and they're selling leftism and leftism is great and all this stuff. But you are responsible for the ultimate conclusions of your ideas because that is where your ideas will go. Your All ideas work themselves out to their ultimate conclusion. So let, let's just see. Let's take a look at the press a little bit. After Nevada. Chris Matthews, Mr. Leftism, Mr. MSNBC Leftism, Mr. Obama sends a thrill up my leg, right? Because these guys, these guys are Obama's children. He may have, you know, he was, he always said, he said of of Bernie too, he said, you know, we just not, he's going too fast. He's going too fast. We all have these ideals, but he's going too fast. But that is what happens to ideas. Ideas work themselves out to their logical conclusions. So now Chris Matthews is in a panic because he sees the left. He's been riding on the leftism train and suddenly he wakes up and he's on the track and the leftism train is heading straight for him. So here's what he said after Nevada. This is cut 15. I was reading last night, Brian, I know you're a history guy, too. I'm reading last night about the fall of France in the summer of 1940. And the general, Renault, calls up Churchill and says, it's over. And Churchill says, how can it be? you got the greatest army in Europe. How can it be over? He said, it's over. So I had that pre- suppressed feeling. I can't be as wild as Carville, but he is damn smart. And I think he's damn right on this one. Carville is saying there's no way you can win with Bernie Sanders. There was a, I think, fire Chris Matthews was trending after this because he compared, um, he compared Bernie Sanders' win in Nevada to the France surrendering <laughs> to the Nazis. And, you know, there is a similarity because after France fell, your, all of Europe was open to the Nazi war machine, and this was totally different. So they're exactly the same when you're on cable TV because this is the way cable people talk, you know, the cable... <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's, also, there's consequences for the way you talk, but everything is like this. I know what he was trying to say. I know what Chris was trying to say. He was trying to say this was the bulwark. This was the place where he was supposed to be stopped. I don't know why he would think Nevada was the place he was going to, supposed to be stopped. But now all, all of uh, Democrat Europe lies open to the Nazi war machine of Bernie Sanders. But, you know, the, the thing is, the thing is, he, Chris Matthews, is responsible for Bernie, too. He's, you know, I mean, you cannot sell these ideas and then complain when somebody takes those ideas to their logical conclusion. The people who are cheering for Bernie may be 12-year-old knuckleheads. They may be idiots who were schooled in this stuff, but they were schooled in this stuff while the media sat by and did nothing. They were schooled in this stuff while the university admissions, well, the university administration cowered at every leftist upsurge. They were schooled in this stuff while the culture, Hollywood, everybody sat and said, yeah, Yes, leftism, social. You remember uh, James Bond in one of the films? Uh, they had him saying, "Well, socialism is not so bad." This is James Bond who helped bring down the Soviet Union. Suddenly, socialism is fine. Now they're now they've created this monster, and they're scared of the monster they created, and it's ridiculous. So, you know, there was a, a media panel. Let's look at this first before we get to some other hilarious stuff that the press has been saying. There's this media panel in California, and Van Gordon Soder, who was the first president of Fox News. Uh, made the following point, that which you've heard here on this show a million times, but maybe you'll take it seriously now that it's not coming from me. It's cut one. The, I think, a liberal bias is increasingly embedded in the journalism as a result of the Trump experience. <clears throat> and it's, it's accelerating and deepening the wedge in our society between the left and the right. Well, Van, is that Let me just finish. Let me just finish. And my concern is that when Trump goes away in one or four years, that may not be corrected, that the journalists may be so comfortable with opinionated reportage and pieces and analysis that that just may become a condition in communications in our society. Right. And he goes on to say, by the way, that that's bad for society to only have one story, which is what I keep saying, because it's bad for both sides. Lawrence O'Donnell, there was a story (laughs) that um, a senior U.S. intelligence official told uh, the Adam Schiff committee that Russia wants to see President Trump reelected. So you would think that at this point, Stuff coming being leaked by the Adam Schiff committee would be suspect. Here's Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC reacting to this report. 
Cut seven. The president is a Russian operative. That sounds like the description of a bad Hollywood screenplay, but it is real. And it is Vladimir Putin's greatest achievement. Decades after America's victory in the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the president of the United States is now helping the president of Russia help the president of the United States to get reelected so that the president of Russia will have four more years of the president of the United States who he wants in the Oval Office. This is one of those shocking news days, if you retain the capacity to be shocked in the Trump era by the Trump regime, which might be better labeled the Trump-Putin regime. And it's one of those breaking news situations that suddenly makes recent news make more sense, like the recent news that Donald Trump has outdone himself by appointing one of the most ridiculous incompetent stooges in the Trump administration to be nothing less than the acting director of national intelligence. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> I'm such a clown. He's talking about Rick Grinnell, by the who, by the way, who was appointed acting uh, to be the acting director of national intelligence, and obviously to clean out the swamp a little bit. By the way, the first time ever an openly gay man has been appointed to a cabinet post. The first time ever. Where were? Where's the word historic? that we hear all the time. Suddenly it's not historic, it's just a Trump partisan. And what happened was this guy, Joseph McGuire, went into the shift committee and briefed them uh, and said, and we don't know what he said. It was a classified briefing. We only know what Adam Schiff leaked. We only know what Adam Schiff leaked to Lawrence O'Donnell. That's it for him. Trump is a Russian spy. And this, you know, and then these guys, and then these guys wonder why, you know, Bernie, why is Bernie the guy? You know, Mark Short went on, uh, Mike, Mark Short is the uh, chief of staff for Mike Pence. He went on with Chris Wallace, and Wallace questioned him about this in a very fierce Wallace-like confrontation. This is cut number nine. You're denying that Shelby Pearson, who's the election security czar, you're denying that under questioning from Democrats, she gave any indication that the Russian efforts to meddle in the election was because they have found a preference for President Trump. You're that, flatly denying that. That was a classified briefing. I'm not going to comment on specifically what she said in that. I am telling well, you, you, you. No, wait I a minute. You did just classify and said there's no one I'm telling you the briefing that the president received that, I've, that I was a, a party to. And that's not information that came out of the briefing that the president got on election security, Chris. But you're not it's denying a, You're not denying that that was part of the I'm briefing tell, that, the, that, the, that whatever she briefing, gave to the committee. Whatever briefing she gave the committee was supposed to be classified. And once again, Adam Schiff's committee is selectively leaking if out information and often distorting information is our belief. They've you, done you, it many you, times. But I don't understand. You're saying it's not true and they leaked it. I'm no, Chris, this is this is pretty consistent and I think pretty clear. What I'm telling you is that is that that was a classified briefing that shouldn't have been discussed. And then and then he said he went on to say he did really well, I thought, against Wallace. And Wallace has, has gotten a little unfair. He cuts people off all the time. And I know people shouldn't be allowed to filibuster, but you still should let them answer the question. But but then he, he went on to say, you know, McGuire came into our office and brie briefed us and I, Mark Short, was there, and he didn't say that. That's not what he said. So at this point, shouldn't Chris Wallace, shouldn't all the press be looking at anything that comes out of Adam Schiff's committee and saying, oh, this is a political leak? I mean, shouldn't they be saying that about every single thing? Now, you know, Jonathan Swan, excellent reporter at Axios, he's, he's got a report that Trump has an enemies list and he's clearing out the, the appointed people in his administration who don't like him. And Swan says, well, it's a little bit haphazard because some of these people were his own appointments and all this stuff. But surely all this time, one of the biggest problems with the Trump administration has been that he hasn't cleared out the old appointments, that the, there is a deep state, that there is a permanent bureaucracy. And these guys have felt that they were empowered to stop Donald Trump. And the New York Times and everything they represent has basically encouraged them in this has said, never mind your stupid constitution. The constitution has to be guarded by this deep state that doesn't exist in the constitution. That has been the actual argument of the New York Times. They're, and, that's the, and that's the left. The New York Times speaks pretty much for the left. This is, you know, the panic over this, the protection of the deep state, the love affair with Barack Obama, all of this Bernie is just the avatar of this. He's just the incarnation of that attitude. They are getting exactly what they wanted, and they're getting it good and hard. 
If you're not quite sold on the Daily Wire membership yet, give us a shot with the Reader's Pass. A Reader's Pass will enable you fellow news junkies to read our articles ad-free. You'll even get Ben's op-eds, which are exclusive for Daily Wire members only, plus access to our mobile app, which is terrific. You can read all of our stories and receive push notifications for breaking news and special content, which is perfect for when you want to stay up to date, but you are on the go. The membership tier is already a bargain at three bucks a month, but right now we're offering one month for 99 cents. That's mobile, ad-free access to all of the Daily Wire news, exclusive op-eds from Shapiro, and breaking news and updates on our mobile app, all for the low price of one buckaroo. So go get a Reader's Pass today and join the Daily Wire community. You can do that as we break, saying goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. Come on over to dailywire.com and subscribe. All right. Um, on MSNBC, a political analyst, a left-wing political analyst, Time Editor-at-Large, Anand Girid Haradas, I'm pronouncing that right, Anand Girid Haradas, said that he is, is surprised at the way people are reacting to Bernie. He thinks they need to open their eyes and see what's going on. His cut 12. Many in this establishment are behaving, in my view, as, as they face the prospect of a Bernie Sanders nomination, like out of touch aristocrats in a dying aristocracy. Just sort of, <laughs> how do we stop this? How do we block this? And there is no curiosity. Why is this happening? What is going on in the yeah. lives of my fellow citizens in this country? They may be voting for something that I find it so hard to understand. What is happening? What is happening? This is a moment for curiosity. I completely agree with this. I completely agree with this. I said this about Donald Trump, that the establishment said Trump, never Trump, hate Trump, bad Trump, evil Trump, never pause to say, what are the people telling us? Maybe, maybe there's somebody who is not Trump who can do what they want, who can do what Trump is doing. I, I, you know, I don't actually think there is because I think Trump, the main thing about Trump has been his pugilistic, loudmouth. Uh, attack on the press, which has made it so easy for left-wingers, left-wing politicians to be polite while the press ripped us to shreds, while the press called us racist, sexist, Islamophobic, you know, homophobic, whatever they wanted to call us. And then Barack Obama could be polite because the press, his army of the press was doing his dirty work for them. We haven't got that. So that's why people voted for Trump, because of the way he talks. And that puts us on a bind. This guy is also right that the people on the left are voting for Bernie Sanders because he is saying what the other candidates will not say, which is we want socialism and we want it now. So let's take a little look at why. You know, the, the thing about socialism is and, and, and communism, because they're really virtually the same thing, is that if you walked around with a Hitler T-shirt, if you walked around with a Goebbels T-shirt, somebody would put a fist in your face. Probably rightly so. Maybe it's a little overreaction, but somebody would approach you about this. But if you walk around with the mass murderer Che Guevara on your T-shirt, nobody says this. If you walk around with a hammer and sickle on your belt buckle or on your denim jacket, nobody says a word to you. Because there is one step between socialism and tyranny, and there's no steps between fascism and tyranny. Fascism is open tyranny. Socialism has this patina, this thin covering of Christian generosity. You heard what Bernie was saying about environmental justice and social justice and this justice and that justice. Anytime you take a word like justice and put a modifier before it, you are erasing the word. It means no. That word means no. Environmental justice means no justice. Social justice means forget the justice. You're not going to get to the justice. But why does that happen? It happens because once you stop saying I, once you stop saying we are individuals in a country together, and you start saying we, we are one mass that has to move here or has to move there, the individual ceases to matter, freedom ceases to matter, and that means that the person in control of that gigantic mass has all the control. And you can hear it. I mean, listen to Bernie talk about uh, illegal aliens, uh, cut 10. What our campaign is about and what our administration will be about is rethinking America, understanding that all of our people, when I say all, I also mean the undocumented in this country, that all of our people are entitled to basic human rights. But who knows about cocaine? Anyone ever seen cocaine? 
So, so all of our people, including uh, are entitled to basic human rights, including cocaine, all of our people. So if you break in, you're one of our people. If somebody bursts into my house, he's family. Someone breaks into my house, it's like, welcome home, son. You know, <laughs> that's it. That's the logic. The rule of law doesn't matter because only the right matters. Only what is right, what he knows, what Bernie knows to be right matters. The system doesn't matter. Nothing matters but what Bernie knows to be right. And that is where this kind of attitude of violence comes up. That's where you get these guys who are sitting there talking about dragging people out of MSNBC and setting them on fire right? That's where you get those guys. Let's play that, that montage of the Project Veritas people, the people who work for uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, do you have that? It's cut. Uh... Yes, you got it. Okay. I'm an anarcho-communist. Pretty much anarcho-syndicalism. There's a lot of me's in the Bernie campaign. Bernie doesn't get the nominees in Milwaukee with Bernie. I mean, we track to truly radical people. Oh, we'll walk into that MSNBC studios, drag those mother up by their hair and light them on fire in the streets. I'm ready to start tearing bricks up and start fighting. It's going to take militancy. I'm already on Twitter following numerous groups around the country that are ready to organize. Like Antifa, yellow vests, all that, but keeping that in the, the back burner for right now. I'll straight up get arms. I want to swim how to shoot and go train. I came this with someone who's uh, an anarchist. I'm an anarcho communist. I'm as far to the left as you can possibly get. I came this with someone who's sort of more of a, a Marxist than this. I'm a communist that believes in pretty much anarcho syndicalism. Blue eyes are actually a man really free education. A lot of the stories were told in the United States about the gulag are exaggerated. How can these privileged people, these white guys in this free country, in this beautiful country, how can they be talking about setting their fellow citizens on fire, putting them in gulags? It's because they're not talking about their fellow citizens. They're talking about this kind of obscure mass of people. Remember Men in Black where they, the guy says, uh, uh, people are stupid, a person is smart. Once you stop seeing the crowd as a bunch of individual people. Once you stop seeing that, you are free to do anything you want. Let's take just take a quick survey of things going on around the country that really tell you what this means. In New York City, uh, New York City regulators now have the final say over what constitutes a fashion faux pas, okay? This is a decision that ha came uh, w when it began in December 2018. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, a lawyer at a social justice nonprofit discovered Prada's Prada Amelia collection. Prada described its bag charms, these little figurines and trinkets. And this guy, whose name is hard to pronounce, Shinir Ize, a lawyer at a social justice nonprofit, saw them and they reminded him of uh, anti-black, you know, black uh, stereotypes. They reminded him of stereotypical things. So they sued. Well, Prada pulled the merchandise, said it never had the intention of offending anyone. All the typical uh, corporate cowardice we're used to now. He said, we abhor all forms of racist and racist imagery. But Miss Easy, it's a woman, I'm sorry, Miss Easy still filed a complaint. And in this week's settlement, Prada denies engaging in unlawful discriminatory practices. Yet, the agreement gives New York City bureaucrats broad influence over the fashion house's day-to-day -day operations, including its creative process, training, and hiring. Prada now must appoint a diversity and inclusion officer who can review all of Prada's designs before they are sold, advertised, or promoted in any way in the United States. The diversity cop will ensure that Prada's activities, including without limitation, its production, advertising, and business activities are conducted in a racially equitable manner. So this major, major designer is now at the service of the New York state government, this guy coming in and telling them when they've offended people because of their cowardice, because they didn't stand up to this woman and shout her down and basically fight her. In uh, a Shawnee from this is from the Federalist, a Shawnee State University professor of religion and philosophy, Nicholas Merriweather, has been told by a federal court that despite his religious objections, he must use the preferred pronouns of transgender students if he wishes to keep his job. Shawnee is a public community college in Portsmouth, Ohio. This guy refused to do that, was threatened by this student, this transgender student, and the judge said the transgender student was right and it wasn't violating his free speech rights. But of course, it is violating his free speech rights because 
when you call somebody by a pronoun, you are saying that that person is what the person says he is. You are basically surrendering to his sense of reality rather than being able to express your own. And this thing on, on sexuality just gets worse and worse and worse. A video came out over this weekend, a woman named Ariella Scarcella. We're going to try and get her on the show. Play this just little clip from here. I'm not one of them. Hi. I'm Arielle. I'm a lesbian. And I don't think gender is a social construct. I don't think cis straight white men are evil. I don't believe that genital preferences are transphobic or that there are 97 genders. I don't think that male sex offenders belong in women's prisons. I don't think it's normal for people to be praised for walking around with shirts that say kill turfs. I don't think like these people. And I no longer want to be associated with them. I've reached peak LGBT. This is my coming out video. Never in my life have I been more cancelled, tortured, tormented, harassed than by members of my own community. Will the voices of individuality strike back against this? Because this guy from MSNBC is right. This is a movement. Bernie represents a part of the country who have lost the plot of America, lost the plot of freedom, and we need to fight back against them like that lady there. All right, a final reflection. I really do have to give out the coveted Clavin Award for best movie of last year. You know, I let, I let the Oscars go by because I don't care about them. Does anybody watch the Oscars anymore? I mean, the Oscars are like going on. I really feel that eventually the Oscars are going to be held in an empty room. And I, it finally, it took me a long time to catch up with some of these movies, mostly because I was busy doing other things like reading, uh, talking to my wife and family and friends, you know, having a real life. But, but I did finally catch up with most of the movies. There are some movies movies I didn't see. I didn't see A Little Women because, as I mentioned, uh, unlike Harvey Weinstein, I don't have a vagina. Harvey Weinstein was convicted. We'll talk about that tomorrow. He's convicted on two of the counts. A really interesting legal case, by the way, but we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, so I didn't see Little Women and I didn't see uh, Marriage Story because I refused to watch a movie by a guy who knows what divorce does to children and then got divorced anyway. He should lock himself in a room. He should beat himself with a whip for 10 years and then he can come out and tell us what he learned. I don't want to hear what he has to say about his egotistical divorce that destroyed his children before that. So those are the two movies I didn't see. Did see 1917. Liked it very much. An entertaining, uh, suspenseful, well-acted, well sh beautifully shot, beautifully shot film. Not a great film when you compare it to other uh, World War I films, but still very good. Ford versus Ferrari. Ferrari, another good film. It's a good year for movies. Ford versus Ferrari, a good film with a very honest look at capitalism, showed the highs of capitalism and how it inspires competition and greatness, but also the lows of capitalism and how it inspires corporate think and snuffs out originality. Joker, decent film. Don't like the superhero movies, just basically a superhero Marvel remake of... Um, a Taxi Driver, which I also a film I didn't like, but kind of interesting, certainly watchable, fun to watch. Uh, Parasite, really overrated. Parasite won the Oscar. Totally, totally overrated. Says Only says that they wanted, they didn't want to give it to the real winner, uh, so they, they gave it to Parasite. It has a big twist in the middle of it, Parasite, and the twist does not work. Great acting, always a lot of great actors on film, but it doesn't work. It's a B-minus film at best, and it really goes off the rail. The Irishman, dull as soap water. I mean, just a dull, long, overly long film with actors who are too old to play the parts. Nothing a computer does will make them younger than they are. They still moved uh, like old men. It was ridiculous. It was just basically a tribute to Martin Scorsese, who has made at least one great film, which is Goodfellas. I also liked his film about Wall Street, which is Goodfellas remade on Wall Street, but still a talented guy uh, who was basically, this was basically his farewell to all his cast and his stories about the mafia. Jojo Rabbit, interesting, shallow, but entertaining and fun, as always, well acted, touching, moving, good film. But clearly, clearly, the film of the year, the winner of the coveted Clavin Award was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This was a film that actually contained some great classic sequences, some sequences that will be remembered uh, as terrific Hitchcock-like sequences, the sequences out at Charles Manson's uh, camp where, um, where Brad Pitt goes out and visits there. That whole, it's a lengthy sequence is just amazing. But as many people said when they saw the film, it's really Brad Pitt's character that makes the film come alive, a tribute not just to masculinity and not just a tribute to old-fashioned, old-style masculinity and decency, but a rebuke 
to the people who think that fame and money are everything because the character on paper is a loser. The character on paper is a loser and it takes until the end of the film for you to understand that despite his personal problems, despite the fact that he's not rich, despite the fact that he's not famous, he's this moral center of the film. And that takes a lot for a Hollywood person to say, Hollywood is a place where success means everything, where fame means everything, where money means everything. It still is all those people who are uh, virtue signaling at the Oscars, they're virtue signaling because that's who they are and they don't want you to know it. But this was a film that actually said in a beautiful way, in a really entertaining way, that uh, that that's not true and those values really uh, are should be rejected and they are will be rejected ultimately. Really good film, overlong still, with some classic sequences in it, clearly the best film of the year, winner of the coveted clave, and the only award that really matters because it's the only award that's given without fear or favor. (laughs) At least I'm entertaining me. That's the important thing, and we'll be back doing that again tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saevitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. Mm